Welcome to the third of the series of tutorials. This one's going to be looking at uh, rendering a landscape using Digimap data. Now, it's going to incorporate parts of the second tutorial and the woodland generation, and we'll start off in the file we left off from part one of the contours. Now, I'm going to be hiding the contour layer because we do not need it for this particular um, section of the tutorial. And we're also going to delete the vector map local layer because we're going to be using the topographic data that we downloaded from Digimap instead. We're also going to be importing the point cloud as well as the 3D buildings that we downloaded as well. Now, this tutorial is going to be a series of worked examples as the majority of the work is actually quite repetitive and you do not need to watch me going through the entire process over about four and a half hours. So we're going to start to clean up the file, deleting the vector map local, but first you'll notice that we're going to have to use purge because there are some blocks that are locked on there. So if we use purge and set all to yes by the layers, and then we can go ahead and delete the vector map local layer. And there we go. So next up, we're going to want to import point cloud data. So if you go to, sorry, the, the topographic data. And there we go. So the next thing we're going to be wanting to do is import the topographic data. So if you go back to your Digimap folder, and go to master map topper standard and we'll be importing the dwg there now the reason i prefer to use the topographic rather than vector map local is the topographic data provides ready-made hatches which we can explode into surfaces duplicate those borders and or more importantly join those surfaces then duplicate those borders it's actually a complexity reduction step it might sound convoluted, but what it allows us to do is split the mesh without having to do it a bajillion times. We only need to do it half a bajillion times. Now, you'll see that we've imported an awful lots of layers. I'm going to separate them out, as I usually do, into area, point, text, and line. Within the areas, I'm also going to be separating them out into natural and artificial surfaces because I'm going to be focusing on using the natural surfaces later on. And by virtue of the process, the majority of the artificial surfaces will end up automatically being created because what we're effectively going to do is create a jigsaw from the mesh that we generate. Um, but before we do that, we're going to need to import the point cloud as well. So once we've finished sorting out these particular layers, will import the point cloud and the 3D buildings. And again, you'll see we've got a block problem. So just use their cell block instance to delete any extraneous blocks we do not need, delete, and then we're going to delete that layer we do not need. When in doubt, purge. There we go. Okay, so you can see from here all the different hatches and some of the hatches have different colors as well. We'll be using that to our advantage later as well when we are um, differentiating between what counts as silt, what counts as sand, mud, shingle, etc. All right, so if we go in Terrain 5 DTM, we're looking for the XYZ file and drag and drop and import. Now you can already see, and we need to create point cloud, make sure that option's checked. Now, as I was about to say, you can already see I've created up some sub layers per my preference. Um, if you've been watching the previous tutorials, you already know that I like to create as many different layers as possible for granularity. Um, 
The other critical thing to mention here is you can see with these points that they're offset from the previous boundary. So I'm going to create a new boundary and that's just dragging the rectangle from one point to the other corner. And then using set points on the z-axis, click in the existing boundary so it sets it to naught on the z-axis. And I'm going to change that to the new boundary layer. We'll be needing that line to help with the creation of the base in a moment. So we've got our point cloud import here. Now we're going to go and import the buildings. So if you go to building heights, NT, and the DWG. Now, the buildings are already imported as meshes. So that's quite convenient for us. And we don't need to do anything more with them. They can just sit comfortably in their own layer and we'll get back to them later on. The next thing we're going to have to do is boot up Grasshopper. But before you do that, as always, make sure you save your file. This is quite a simple script. It's fundamentally the same script I used at the beginning of part two when creating the mesh base. We're going to be using Cockroach and we're going to be using the Delano mesh. We're also going to be using Quad Remesh. So if you go into Cockroach, you want Point Cloud and Cloud Explode. And then you're going to want to double click on the canvas and type in Delano mesh. And then you're going to want to double click again and look for quad remesh. And you want the quad remesh settings as well. So if you connect up the various bits and bobs, M to M, P to P, and Cloud to C, you'll notice that I have locked the solver at this point. This is um, so that the script doesn't jump ahead of itself because it is quite a long process, especially the remeshing. As regards to the settings, we're going to want um, the TC variable to be 1250000. So that's 1.25 million. And then adaptive size, we want it 100%. And adaptive count. We want that to be true. Hard edges, we can set true. Seam edges as default, so that's naught. Same with symmetry, none. And guide curves, naught being approximate. So that's fine. So I'm going to disable those for a moment because those are very computationally intensive. If we go to file and properties and then widgets, one useful thing I pointed out last time, if you go down to Profiler, that tells you how long each particular segment of a Grasshopper script takes. So you can very easily see which are the bottlenecks in your particular script. So if we start with selecting the point cloud, unlock the solver, you can see that the explosion factor already took 324 milliseconds. Now, I'm just going to hide that layer for a moment and then we're going to enable the Delano mesh. Now the reason I'm doing a quad remeshing instead of just using the Delano mesh is theoretically the quad remeshing actually brings the poly count down or provides you the option of bringing the poly count down. It's also a mesh based on quadrangles rather than triangles which can reduce complexity whilst ensuring that the detail is kept. That's why I prefer to use quad remesh. It is, however, very computationally intensive. When I did a test run on a system comparable to that of my um, old university, um, which was a four core, eight thread system, that took about 20 minutes. Um, the system I'm running now is a 16 core system, and that took about 20 minutes. 
So it's uh, perfect timing to set it running and then do some sketching or doing whatever it is you need to do in parallel to this process. So you can see there it's saying 10 minutes on the clock. So we're going to bake that and I'm going to put it into um, the train mesh and I'm going to divide out those two layers in a moment as well so I can show you what both the quadri mesh and the Delano mesh look like. Now, as you'll see in a second when I zoom in, the difference between the quadrangle and triangular mesh base. There you go. So on the left, you've got the Delano mesh. On the right, you've got the quadri mesh. And you can already see that one is um, triangulated and the other is quadrangulated. And the one on the right just aesthetically looks a lot smoother. So if you are wanting to go with a mesh-based texture, and by that I mean the same kind of texture there, no, sorry, it's the same kind of texture I used in one of the far earlier tutorials, um, then quad remeshing, I feel, provides the far better aesthetic. In this instance, I also had far less hassle with splitting the quad remesh as opposed to the Delaunay mesh, which is the other thing you need to factor in. Mesh splitting can get a bit janky, which is why I always create a backup of the original mesh in case I need to um, split the original mesh rather than the split mesh, if you follow. So as I said, I'm just going to rename those two layers for a moment and going to hide the Delano mesh because we will not be needing that one. And I'm just going to shift the quad free mesh back onto the correct axes. There we go. Okay. So now onto the base. We need to duplicate the border of the quadri mesh, and I'm going to explode that particular border, and we're just going to deselect the edge extremities of those so we can quite easily rejoin as four separate lines. But before we do that, I'm just going to rearrange those borders for a second. And we're going to displace by minus 50 and then offset by 52.5. So the displacement was on the z-axis and then on the x and y of the offset. So here I've exploded the border and I'm just deselecting the endpoints. And then I'm going to use join again. And then I'm going to do a drag box selection. And we're going to end up with four separate lines. The reason we're doing it this way is because of the offset function. If I did offset, um, and I'm going to offset by minus 52.5 again. If I did offset using the command, we'd end up them, with them being offset along the Z axis as opposed to the X and Y axes, which is what we're looking for. Now I'm going to create some rectangles in the corner and explode those rectangles so we can create the necessary surfaces as well as um, the external border or the offset border. So I'm just going to use explode there. And then I'm going to use Edge Surface. You could have also used Planar Surface before exploding them. But I'm using Edge Surface on all of the segments here. And then you repeat for the other three sides as well. And 
know, I'm just selecting the outer outer line and isolating them. This is so I can join them up slightly more easy because we're going to have to then do a edge surface again vertically to create the side surfaces and then show and explode the outer rectangle on the bottom and then I'm just going to create a line joining the two points vertically same as the other edge and you then use edge surface and repeat across all four you know, all four surfaces again you could also create um, corner lines as well and use planar surface after joining them up but I prefer using edge surface Fundamentally, when it comes to a process like this, I would advise using whichever you deem to be quicker. All right, now we're creating the base, which we'll be splitting in a second. And that was using edge surface again. And then I'm going to select all of the other surfaces at the moment, just lock them again for ease of selecting. Now we're going to do the same thing on the interior edges, creating those interior, interior surfaces. But this time we're using loft. Now, if we unlock and we'll be using split. So select the base, split, and then select the interior edge. And there we go, we can delete the innermost surface now. And I'm just going to select all poly surfaces and surfaces and join, and then we'll end up with a closed poly surface, which will be our base or rim whichever you wish to call it. All right, and now we're going to start sorting out our hatches. So as I said, this is actually a very repetitive process. I'm going to do a worked example, and then we're going to fade into the next section. Now, one thing I am going to flag here is that we will need to recreate the low water line. And that's going to be um, by copying certain of these elements and then exploiting the line work, but we'll cover that in a moment. So, start with the agricultural land area. I'm just going to select those objects, explode, then I'm going to join. And then I'm just going to dupe border. And that is the process. Select, explode, join, dupe border, and then delete the surfaces you no longer need. Rinse and repeat for each category. Now, you're also going to come across a category such as the foreshore natural, where you've got multiple different color attaches. Now in those instances, I'm just going to create sublayers, and I'm going to use the cell color command. And that's color spelt in the American way. And I'm just going to copy or move those differently colored layers and hatches, sorry, hatches rather, into the different layers. Well, let's get them muddled up there. And again, then it's just a case of rinse and repeat, explode, join, dupe border, ad infinitum. Now, 
nobody said that 3D modeling was always going to be sexy. However, I personally feel that the reward at the end is worth it, especially when you consider that uh, what you're doing here is actually fundamentally creating your site. Like, if this were a project, you'd be creating your contextual site model right now. And then you'd be creating the basis for which you can work into for the rest of your 3D modeling. And I would say that's actually a pretty good trade for what is fundamentally half a day to a day's worth of work. You're creating the original context as well as the basis for creating the context of whatever proposal it is you're seeking to design. I don't think that's a bad trade-off. And you'll see here that sometimes you create surfaces that are just too big to join in any timely manner. So when that happens, I just do border and join them manually. And then I tidy up afterwards. So, with those examples done, we're going to fade into the next, next part. All right, so with your finished uh, um, areas done, if you duplicate them and you shift into the projected line work category, that way we have a backup of what we've done in case things go wrong and we need to reset. Now, one thing I'm going to do is using the border, I'm going to create a planar surface on that external border, changing it to the medium height, the mean high waterline category, set it to the same Z height as that water line. Then I'm going to show and unlock the both the best base and the mesh layer and use mesh split command. This is so we can create a plane, a mesh plane at the level of the high water and that we're going to be using that later on for texturing. So you can see it's split there. And all we need to do is create the water area there. So that's our mean high water line meshed effectively. So the next thing we're gonna to have to do is recreate the mean low water line. So I'm just gonna create a temporary category called MLWL2 after we look at foreshore natural and the inland water layers and tidal water areas, um, as well as mud sand shingle to figure out exactly which line work we're going to need to copy to recreate the mean low water line. And we'll likely need to copy the boundary as well. That's a pretty um, self-explanatory process. So once you've decided which ones we're going to be copying, and you can use the existing mean low water line that we copied from the contour layer. And once that's done, all you need to do is explode the copied line work and manually tidy all of that up. And then rejoin. <clears throat> now, when I zoom in, you'll be able to see the why as to why we're recreating and that's because the old mean low water line doesn't match up with the new one. And it doesn't match up with the new line work from our new areas either. 
I'm assuming that's because both the contours that the Ordnance Survey provide and the topographic layer that the Ordnance Survey provide are done to different tolerances and potentially exported from different software as well. Now I'm going to be using the end analysis tool to figure out um, whether the curve is closed, if not, where it's open, and it's also flagged an element here, which doesn't quite line up to the existing. So I'm just going to delete those pieces and we're going to close that up manually and then join, and that's going to be our new mean low waterline done. and can just get rid of any extraneous curves that we don't need. There we go. Just going to go into properties and change the display color to by layer as well. All right, so that's looking a bit more like it. So I can get rid of the old mean low waterline layer and I'm just going to rename the new one to be the old one. Now I'm going to repeat the process for the inland water, so the river, along with any um, canals or streams that appear up on the map as well. You need to do some manual readjustments and reconnecting with the streams as well, because of course that you've got at least one bridge, one road bridge in the area, which uh, severs it on the map, but we're looking at manipulating the mesh itself, so we want to make sure that those streams are um, contiguous. After that's all said and done, we'll be throwing into Google Earth. And that is so we can start to create the patchwork landscape that we're familiar with from the satellite photos, along with labeling the areas appropriately again. So whether they be mud, sand, shingle, whether they have boulders, whether they be woodland, whether they're dense or light woodland, whether they're agricultural land. And we can also subdivide the um, agricultural properties as well. And I'm going to color them in Rhino appropriately so that we can now, for instance, here I've decided we've got three broad categories of agricultural land, judging from the color gradients on Google Earth. And that's going to provide me my patchwork textures. So the next thing we're going to go over, and that's the adjustments I made to the grasshopper script we covered in the second part of the woodland generation. Now I've just imported a couple of blocks that I used in the process. Um, I fundamentally created what I'm calling fuzzy bounds. I just you know, sketched around the entirety of the woodland areas to create one super area. Um, and that was um, to save going through 400 or so different curves. Um, and then I did some adjustments to the grasshopper script to um, uh, categorize those points according to the various curves. So you can see first here, I've got line item and I've got the fuzzy bounds input and that's because I've got two bounds and I use line item just to switch between the two when I wanted to uh, ensure Gallup. And so Galapagos was only solving one of them.
the rest of that particular particular Galapagos segment has broadly remained the same, with one major exception, and that is I've increased the number of multiplications occurring, and that was so that Galapagos could hit those high numbers required um, to ensure that the area remained, um, or to ensure that the target area was met. So you can see there, I've doubled the number of multiplications going on. Now, this is the bit where I was using um, the various points to collate them into the various curves. So the first is just using sift and point and curve to isolate the points within the woodland curves. Then I needed to recalculate the total tree weights with respect to the new total number of points. And then I did sense check between the two. Um, and then I did a pseudo random distribution between the various um, woodlands boundaries as well. And then the final element of actually spawning and putting in pseudo randomization of the rotations that has broadly remained the same as well. So those were the major uh, changes in that script, so it's scaled up in a relatively sane way. And this is the generated woodlands that resulted, which I'll be inserting as a block and linking it rather than embedding. All right, so if we take a look at this then, we can see that um, unfortunately some of the trees are in fact perhaps comically large. For all intents and purposes of this particular exercise, they're fine. Um, but of course, if you watch the last tutorial, you'll know how to adjust those trees to suit the terrain a little bit more. Um, it's just a question of changing a couple of variables here and there. Um, but aesthetically, for all intents and purposes, this suits us. So the next thing um, I'll be doing is going through and splitting the mesh. And again, I'm going to do one or two word examples, and then you should be able to go through the rest. And I won't be showing the entirety of the process because this is the bit that took a solid hour, hour and a half for me to actually go through myself. We'll start firstly with splitting the low water line and then the inland water because that's going to divide the mesh into about three segments, not equal segments, but three segments, which will just help with highlighting elements later. Okay, so I'm going to be working in top-down view for this. We're going to use the mesh split command. After I copy the mesh onto divided mesh, and then mesh split, and then select the curve in question. It's going to be a lot of zooming in and out so you know which curves you're selecting. And 
and there we go, our first split. So next thing we're going to have to do with this is um, go through and make sure that we've got all of the various different curves we need to split, split in. And we'll also need to do some splitting on the cyan mesh as well now, because there are elements in there which are still going to be black, because they're going to be either silt or mud sections that will need to be categorized later on. And you can see I wasn't understating when I said you're going to do a lot of zooming in and out, because of course highlighted mesh being yellow, that's going to pretty much obscure any and all line work underneath. So there is a lot of zooming in and out, that's unavoidable. Right, so we now have our three separate sections, and this is what I was talking about when I said this is going to be useful, because it's going to allow you to hide a segment, double check underneath which lines still need to be used to split. You can even shift segments out. I like to use factors of 5000 in this instance, because that is fundamentally one grid. Um, and so I shift that out, allows for an easier selection, and there we go, we can see quite quickly which set segments then need to be pushed into different layers. Just makes the process a hell of a lot quicker. And since the process is already quite slow and laborious, you want to make it as easy as possible. Now, you might be asking me, okay, so why are you splitting this a thousand times rather than just selecting all of the line work and splitting it once? Um, well, the flippant response is, good luck with that. The useful response is, been there, done that, tried it, crashed the computer. Also, been there, done that, tried that, crashed Rhino. Been there, tried that, done that, it didn't work because um, it didn't actually split everything. This is why you have to unfortunately do it manually and that's why I categorize everything. So you can divide the process up, you can keep an easier track of where it is you are in the process and even if it doesn't necessarily go quicker, it works, which is the critical, critical thing and you end up with a product that's useful. Right, so that's that word example done. Let's move on. Okay, you can see here, this is going, an example of where things go wrong and how to salvage. And this is also a critical example of why you keep the original unsplit mesh. So I'm having problems splitting this particular segment here. So if I shift that particular line work over and then I create a copy of the original mesh using Alt and Gumball, and then I'm going to split this using Mesh Split and I'm going to select the line underneath. Now, once this is split, you'll see that it has split beautifully There we go. How's about that? What a beauty. Now, what happens if I try and split this mesh that's already been split several times already? Mesh split, select the line work.
Drum roll, please. Oh no! Oh no! Where'd he go? Basically, Rhino's thrown a whoopsie. So this is why we create the no, sorry, this is why we keep the original mesh so that in these times of oh no, we can salvage things without pulling our hair out. Um, and so we can keep that segment because it has in fact cut cleanly along the line we want it to cut or split. It just, for whatever reason, decided to um, disappear the other segment we wanted. So not the end of the world because we had the original. I'm not saying it would be the end of the world if you didn't have the original, but there would be a lot of sighing and maybe crying involved. And so this is what it looks like once it's all been split. Now, there's a significantly black chunk in the bottom right hand corner or now on the left hand side of this image. I only realized that I um, threw a wobbly and did a wrong one there um, later on. But basically, there's actually a lot more greenery in that black area than I originally um, twigged. That's purely down to the fact that I was doing this for an hour and a half and I was tired by that point. So I fixed that later on. But in the meantime, we're going to start to go through the um, V-Ray settings you're going to need and the kinds of textures we'll be using. They're all V-Ray standard textures and we will just be using multiples of them. The other critical thing that we're going to have to do is we're going to have to go through and select all the various mesh pieces and go into layer properties and UV mapping properties. So I'm just going to unlock so I can select all of the pertinent layers. properties objects and then texture mapping and then type you want planar UV. This now matches up with how V-Ray is going to be mapping the textures and I'm just going to set the size to 111. That's because we're going to be playing with the UV tiling arrangement within the V-Ray settings themselves, the individual texture settings that we're going to be using rather than setting them from Rhino. I will personally admit that texture mapping within Rhino is still something that feels pretty alien to me and your mileage may vary but what I have learned is critically setting the type to planar UV usually does the trick. Box mapping can also work but for all our purposes we want we want planar UV. Now if we bring up V-Ray first thing we're going to want to do is bring up the sun and we're going to want to set the lat long to Edinburgh so we get a vaguely realistic uh, lighting setup. So if in the search box you just type in Edin and that will bring up Edinburgh and then I'm going to set the date to be roughly the summer solstice of 2022 and probably about I mean, here I'm going to type in 3 o'clock, but later on I'm going to change that to 2 o'clock so the lighting is whiter rather than orange. And then within the V-Ray properties of the sun, I'm going to change the sky model to PRG clear sky, and in the options I'm going to set the sun as invisible, but still casting shadows. Right, next thing I'm going to do is chuck in an infinite plane. I'm also going to be shifting the entire model to the Rhino origin. The reason for doing so is previously when I've run V-Ray um, using the OS grid system, it's frequently chucked up an error going, warning, rendering may be off due to the severe displacement of the model from the Rhino origin. So, whenever I'm rendering in V-Ray now, I make sure that whatever it is I'm rendering is positioned at the Rhino origin. So I'm just going to use the move, move command 
and I'm going to set the center point using O snap and center, and I'm going to just set it as the center of one of the boundaries. And then once that's done, I'm going to be shifting the infinite plane to below the lower end of the base to make sure that the infinite plane is not cutting the model off at any point. Right, now to switch off the layers I don't need. And we're going to go back into the V-Ray settings and sort all of that out. As I said, I'm just going to use set point to shift the infinite plane to below the base. There we go. I'm also going to save this particular viewport as well. Although in hindsight, I don't think I needed to because I'm pretty certain the export um, view was the same view, but you know what? Never mind. All right, now for the important bit. I've already created some um, textures when I did a test run of this tutorial, so I'm just going to drag and drop them in and I'm going to run through them for you. I'm also going to um, import the settings I used as well, and I'll run through those later. So, as I said earlier, all of these textures are very standard and they are available from the um, pre-designed materials found in the catalogue. This first one that I've labelled black massing is based from the aluminium anodized dark grey. That's been my go-to for a matte massing um, for most of the, in fact, most of my academic career. Um, I changed surface control to use roughness under reflection rather than glossiness, and that provides more matte feel. You can set the diffuse color as well more easily, um, either using the slider or typing in values immediately. Everything else I pretty much keep the same as is the default. Now, in the grass, that's underneath the ground um, subcategory and I'll be using a few of those different grass types to create the patchwork feel later on. The critical thing, however, is if you expand and go to UVW placement, the U scale is set to 1000 from the default of 100. So if I just show you the difference here, that's 100, that's 10, and this is 1000. Now, because we're looking at it from a bird's eye view at a very great scale, you do not see the grain of the grass. You see the overall texture of the light on it, but you don't see the grain. So that's why I shift the UVW to a thousand. So you can still see kind of the color and the diffuse, but you don't see the grain. Similarly with sand and water high, they both have UVW placement as it's water low. Water high and water low are based on waves A01 and A02 and liquid. And you can see here I've changed high to 1000, low I kept at 100 to differentiate the two as well. And again, you can change the fog color as well as the depth for both of them. That provides some interesting effects. Now, the critical thing between water high and water low is underneath reflection, not just that I've changed the fog depth and color, 
but underneath the reflection variable at the top, I've disabled Fresnel. When I had Fresnel enabled, that was causing the um, texture to appear completely black underneath the water high texture. That's likely just to do with how um, light rays work within V-Ray and how it's all coded. Um, so disabling that and adjusting a couple of other things is what prevented that from happening for me. Now, the other cool thing, not just the tune, tune renderer, which is quite fun. However, bear in mind, if you render on the GPU, the contour will not appear. But I don't mind that because I'm not using it for the contour, I'm just using it for another matte option. But the other thing you find under Dark Chromatic is various different kinds of grid textures, which just so happens in this instance to line up perfectly with the Rhino grid and its uh, um, divisions. So it lines up perfectly with the scale. It just looks like an old mathematics graph from when I was doing my GCSEs and A-levels. Um, so if I set them to the infinite plane, you'll be able to see what I mean in a moment. So if I select material, select the plane and click apply to selection. And here you go. Here's the first um, graph grid. And then there's the second type of graph grid. And as I said, it honestly just looks like an old um, mathematics uh, textbook grid. Um, so if it's of interest to you, by all means, play with it. The tricky thing, of course, is going to be to ensure that the um, the, you know, the divisions match up with whatever scale you're using. In my case matches up perfectly, but your mileage may vary, of course. So, if I apply both water to the high and low water categories, and you can immediately see the difference. There we go. Now you can see the low water line is already a lot darker. So I'm going to have to play with the diffuse of that. And that is again going to change when we put in the um, color for the sand and mud because the gradient will change, the reflectivity will change, and the rendering itself will change. So this is just a brief overview of this particular part. And then once I've played with that diffuse a bit, you can see it's already got some lighter. If I change the fog depth, you can see that's had little to no noticeable effect when it re-renders. There we go. Little to no noticeable effect. So I'm just going to change that back. But the diffuse, the diffuse is what changes things. Okay. So I'm going to leave you to go through and apply all of the other textures you need to apply. You can see the ones I've used as base. I've used soil, grass, sand, and tune as a base, along with the water as a base. And you can adapt and adjust as necessary. So let's fast forward. And here you go. This is a rough idea of what it looks like with all of the various patchwork quilts of agricultural land. And it's still, and you can see now also, because I've put in the darker silty sand underneath, the gradient between the high water and the low water textures is um, a lot softer. You can st still get the depth difference, but it's a lot softer. Now, as regards to settings, the critical ones are I've used brute force for both primary and secondary cache. 
and I've unclamped max ray intensity, max traits, depth, and secondary ray and adaptive lights. We only have one light, so we don't need adaptive lights. And I'm also using a widescreen resolution of the render. I'm just going to render a standard widescreen 4K um, rather than bothering with an A2 render of this one. Now, one thing you, that you must remember is to create a material random color layer as well because we're going to be needing that material ID when we go into Photoshop later on. The other ones are not necessary, but so long as you've got material random color in there, you're good to go. And then when you're ready, just hit render. Now you can see at this point, I've already flagged up for myself that whoops, I went wrong, as I mentioned earlier. There's a lot more greenery in the left hand side than there is actually in the render itself. So at this point in the process, I just go back, check my own work, and re-split when necessary. And now you can see a significant difference already. And that's starting to look a lot more like an interpretation of the satellite photo from Google Maps or Google Earth. Now I'm going to save as a VR image for backup and then I'm going to save the RGB and material ID layers separately as PNGs. You can, as always, do your own adjustments. I've decided to put in an exposure adjustment for this but left all of the others. Once those are saved, we're going to go into Photoshop. Okay, so First things, I'm going to create some temporary layers for the um, texture mapping and the um, clipping masks. All I'm going to be looking for is a clipping mask for the background, for the natural areas, for the water, and also for the artificial areas. Those are the only masks that I'm going to be interested in for this. So as usual, magic wand tool, setting tolerance to whichever it is you prefer, and creating the masks accordingly. Now I'm just going to do some very simple textures for these. Firstly, I'm going to hide the background, and then I'm going to drag in a um, plaster type texture, a concrete type texture, and my own custom image mask as well, which I created from various different parchment and concrete type textures. Now this particular plaster texture I downloaded from um, the web for free. It's a great one just to provide a bit of um, roughness or differences to a texture. This one, it works beautifully because it helps provide a worked feel to the agricultural areas. So if you just go through and change the opacity, multiply works rather nicely. Darkens not too bad. Overlays way too bright. Soft light, a eh, bit pale, and the rest are just psychedelic. So, for this one, I'm going to decide to settle on multiply. Bit dark, but for all intents and purposes, combined with the other textures I'm going to be putting in, I feel that this one's the better result. And again, whichever particular one you feel suits best. As with anything texture-based, personal preference is king. So, 
I'm working this to how I prefer it to look. But if you're doing something similar, of course, you will work it however you prefer it to work. However, one particular thing I am going to show you is this particular parchment texture. Again, just got it online. For me, this just brought a lift to the water and it was rather spectacular in the way it lifted it. So I just used soft light and I reduced the opacity. But you can already see it looks like it's now got life to it. The light's catching it in different places. It looks like it might have currents. It looks like it might have a bit of you know, waves here and there. It just yeah, it brings a bit of life to it. And then I'm just going to get rid of the grid. There we go. Now I'm going to save and export that. And I'm going to open it up into Illustrator to put in some finishing touches. Drag and drop the render export. Then I'm going to go back into the cloud file I created a long time ago. And I'm going to drag and drop those clouds in. Now, these clouds are created using the vector art brush in Illustrator. Um, the charcoal and watercolor brushes specifically. I reduced the opacity to about 5 or 10 and just layered them up. And it just creates a nice wispy look. So I'm just going to position them and admittedly whilst the clouds themselves don't aren't actually quite as visible or lifting as much on the part one of that contour field because there's a lot more in the way of colour and texture going on in the main image. The shadows from the clouds, they still help to you know, bring a bit of life to the image here. And I think that's the key thing because otherwise this could be a very stale image and you want to bring some life to it through texture usage or through creating artificial clouds such as this. And if we go to file and then export and export as use artboard after you select PNG. And then as I said, I'm just going to export it as a 72 PPI image. And that's the end of the third part of this series of tutorials. So to recap, we started in Rhino, importing topographic, building heights and point cloud data, mesh the point cloud, then split that mesh using the topographic data to create a patchwork of textures, which we rendered in V-Ray. Then we finished off in Photoshop and Illustrator to provide the final touches. As always, thank you for listening and keep an eye out when the next tutorial is posted.